Welcome to Founderline. I'm Joe Beninato, your host, and thank you for joining us today. This is our second show, so I'd like to take a moment just to talk about why we've created Founderline and what we're trying to do here. Our goal is to provide uh, a forum for startup people, whether they're founders or people who are thinking about joining a startup or employees, uh, to be able to ask questions of investors and entrepreneurs and try and get some help if they're making decisions about what they're going to do with their company or if they're going to go and join uh, a startup that they've been interviewing at. And so, um, uh, you know, we really want to hear from people in the audience. You can call in, you can tweet to us, you can email us. I'll give you all of that information in a second. But uh, the goal is to get you answers to the questions you have and, uh, and try and help you out. Um, so this is a live show. We're, uh, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to screw up for sure. And, uh, but we want to hear from you. So please call us. Uh, the number is uh, it's toll free. It's 1-844-4-FOUNDER. And you don't have to dial the last R on the, uh, on the founder. You can email us at help at founderline.com. Or you can tweet to at founderline. All of those ways we'll get it. If you're worried about anonymity, you can actually go to our website and there's an ask a question tab and you can click on that and submit a question uh, right on the website. So uh, with that, let's, uh, let's get the show started. We, our guest today is Paul Martino, who's the founder and general partner at Bullpen Capital. Um, Paul's a great entrepreneur and investor. Um, he's been involved with companies, uh, founder of Aggregate Knowledge, investor in Zynga and FanDuel. Um, Paul was actually an investor in my last company, Tello, and so uh, we've worked together in the past. And I, and I have to say, um, you know, he's one of the best investors that I've ever worked with, um, and that's not sucking up. I, I, I mean that. Um, so, Paul, welcome, and thank you for joining us on Founderline today. Hey, well, thanks, Joe. I love trying to pioneer a new idea like this, and thank you for the compliment. Absolutely. Uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk throughout the show about some of the reasons, re reasons I think that. But um, before you know, we dive into questions, what I usually like to do is just get a little bit of um, background so mm -hmm. that the audience you know, knows a little bit more about you. So um, let's, let's walk through that a little bit. So computer science geek you know, mm -hmm. by training, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then uh, worked in a bunch of startups. Uh, you know, Tribe was one that stood out to me, one sure. of the earliest social networks around. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know I, know, I know with the success of Zynga, a lot of people are interested in um, Mark Pincus. And yeah. so I'm curious, like, what, what was it like um, in the early days of Tribe, you mm -hmm. know, working with Mark to, to get that off the ground? Well, see, uh, the, thing that, the thing that you got to remember about Tribe is Tribe ultimately was not successful. And the reason that that's so important answering the question about Mark is because every day we went into the office trying to figure it out. And that is a hard thing to do. I yeah. mean, we, we raised money from Mayfield, the Washington Post, Knight Ritter, and we had a lot of expectations. We had a really big idea. We, we, we knew we were swimming in the right pond. But, you know, other companies came, attracted much larger audiences, and we would come in and we would scratch our head. And it was Val Syme and me and Chris and, and Mark. And Zynga, on the other hand, hit it out of the park right out of the gate. Yeah. And so yeah. there really are kind of, as you'd expect, there are two different kinds of guys. The person who's hit it out of the park and is optimizing for success, and the guy who's coming in going, what do we got to do? And so uh, most of my experience with him was sitting at that whiteboard trying to figure out how to make it work. And those were some long days, I'll tell you that. I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> you and I have been there together, yes. actually. So, yeah. um, and, then, uh, and then after that, you started Aggregate Knowledge. And I know that, like most startups, had its ups and downs as right. well. But you know, recently had a, had a great um, exit. And so talk, talk a little yeah. bit about your Aggregate Knowledge uh, experience. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm very proud of what we did there. We, we started as a recommendations as a web service company. And it was going great. And we were kicking butt. And we had lots of customers and big names. And then we realized that the barrier to entry to the product was too low. And we had hundreds of competitors show up almost overnight after hmm. we raised our big money. And we knew that ultimately we had to be in a different business. And luckily, we had very patient investors who let us go find that other business. And ultimately, we ended up using our high-performance uh, computing infrastructure to do data management for major ad agencies and uh, direct media advertisers. Hmm. And I hired a great, great guy named Dave Jakubowski to take over for me as CEO because we needed a media 
savvy uh, Madison Avenue kind of guy. And uh, that's not you. Well, you know, I, I might have been able to figure it out, but it would, would have been much better for that to have a ready-made guy, which is what yeah. I found in Dave. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the outcome because I can say that Dave's the best hire I've ever made in my life. And when you're replacing yourself as CEO and you can say that about the hire, that's pretty good. That's pretty unusual too, right? I mean, it, the, the, those, those situations don't always work out for the best, right? No, no. So, and uh, the funny story I, that Dave and I joke about now that we're very good friends four or five years later, the first six months of the job, he basically didn't believe me that I wanted him to have the job. He kept, <laughs> for six months, he just basically kept thinking that I was going to come back and take my job back. I'm like, Dave, trust me, I want you to have this job. <laughs> That's, that's great. Um, and then uh, in 2010, I think it was, uh, started Bullpen Capital. Right. And, um, you know, Bullpen, I think, is really interesting uh, because it's not, uh, you know, a seed stage company that's trying to be the first money in. Actually, a very different um, mm -hmm. philosophy. So talk a little bit about how you got to Bullpen and then, uh, you know, the, the approach you guys are taking now with, with some of your companies. Well, it was... Uh uh, uh, a mathematical certainty in our opinion that there was going to be a big mismatch between the traditional funds that were going later and later and the Cambrian explosion of seed funds. At some point, the balance was just going to shift in terms of the total number of dollars, the total number of investments, the total number of GPs. And uh, sometime between 2009 when we brainstormed the idea and now 2014, the so-called Series A crunch happened. Yep. And uh, it, it's... It, it comes and goes, and I think there's going to be another leg of it happen. And what we said to ourselves was, boy, there's a lot of very promising companies that if they just hit another six months, another 12 months of milestones, they're going to be able to go raise big money at big prices from the traditional guys. And so we uh, named it Bullpen because we feel like we're the blue-collar, sixth and seventh inning guy who comes into the game. We want to get six outs and then get to the closer. And so if it goes right, a, a first round, a floodgate, a true... Uh, does a deal first, uh, we put another million bucks in that company, get them to the next milestone, and then the Kleiners and Sequoias and Bessemers come in and do the big round after us, and we've created value the whole way. That's great. And uh, so, and it's you, you, Duncan, and Rich, right, are the, mm -hmm. the three main partners. So yeah. um, guys you had worked with before, then, and you knew them when you, when you came together, or how did how'd the fund come together? Yeah, so uh, I was... Uh, approached by a good friend about joining his fund as uh, his first partner and I called up my two angel investing buddies Duncan and Rich just as a hey what do you think of this idea huh. and that led to about six months of brainstorming that we identified this opportunity and uh, you know I got I got Rich and Duncan to quit their day jobs and come come do this uh, and so it's it you know as you know it's easy to have an idea it's a lot harder to quit your day job and go do it absolutely all right great well um, once again if you, uh, if you want to give us a call, it's one eight four 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 founder uh, Email is help at founderline.com. And you can also tweet to us at, at founderline on Twitter. So um, let's, uh, let's move into the question piece. We have, we have a bunch of, uh, of emails that have come in so far. So um, let's start with uh, Alice in Daly City. Um, and the question is, is actually interesting because we've been through this together. How do you know when to pivot and what to pivot to? Which is a great uh, question, yeah. right? Well, the second part's a lot harder than the first one. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's for sure. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it's quite obvious when it's time to pivot, but having the intestinal fortitude to call the ball and pivot is the hard part. I mean, that yes. is the hard, you yes. see the writing on the wall, you come into the office every day, you know it's not working, you know the team is wrong, you know the product's wrong, you know the product market fit is wrong. I would say it's very obvious when it's time to pivot, but you've got to have the stones to pivot. That to me is all about an internal battle with the CEO himself, herself. Yeah. But the what to pivot to, now that, that's a much harder thing. I mean, you have to look at the assets you've got. What, what have you built? What are you good at? And then you almost have to start the company all over again. And that is a very painful, uh, quite frankly, lonely process, the times I've had to do it or times I've had to help companies do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, we went through that with Tello, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we thought, okay, Bullpen's going to put in this capital and we're, we're, we're mm -hmm. close to product market fit and it turned out we weren't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember the, the nights uh, with that gnawing at me and trying to decide, okay, how do, how, do we, how do we pull this off? And all the while, I don't know if you remember this, but we had a major bank that was like 
always about to sign a deal, right? And uh, <laughs> and then it turns out it's a no revenue deal, and you just right. say, all right, th we've we've had enough of this. Um, we got very lucky because it happened to be actually right around. Um, end of June and WWDC with Apple had just happened right. and so that's when we when they announced Passbook yep. and that gave us uh, you know a great idea for that so I I mean I, I agree it's it, you know you know you have to do something but it's like well what do we go do like what is this team good at what what assets do we have right. and um, and then you know when when you start to float the idea around you kind of have to judge the reaction and and read the room and see sure. all right is half my team about to bail out on me because right. You know, they they signed up to do X, and now we're going to go do Y, and so um, those are those are really um, those are really tough situations. So um, hope hope uh, that gives you a little bit of help. Um, let's uh, let's go to the next question, and it is uh, it's from Eric in Palo Alto, and the question uh, it's an email. It's um, when two co-founders are creating a new startup, how do you divide up equity and put controls in place? to ensure that each founder is maximizing their contribution to the company? This is actually a great, um, a great question because this happens all the time, right? Yeah. Like founders mm -hmm. get together and they want to work on something, but they don't have the hard conversation around, mm -hmm. hey, are we splitting this 50-50? Or what about that guy, Tom, who's helping us out with the database work? Right. Like, what do we do for him? Or, so uh, so what, do you, what do you think about that? This is, the, this is the advice I personally followed in the companies I started, and it's the advice I give to, to people when asked the question. You should separate your founding responsibility from your day job. And you should literally slice up the pie as a founder's stake, and that, in my opinion, should in general be as close to even as possible. Hmm. And then there's a job stake, and that can be really where the difference comes in. Okay. Now, if I'm going to be the CEO and I'm starting a company and, and you're going to be just basically the lead engineer because you know I have a lot more of a resume to go do that than you do, then I'm going to get a CEO compensation in terms of the stock that's going to be really different than your software engineering. Yeah. But if we spend all the time founding the company together and getting the idea and the prototype together, et cetera, the idea that there should be massively disparate founding stakes, I think, causes more trouble than not. So that's what I advise uh, founders to do is, is put it in those two buckets, have an honest discussion about what those contributions are going to be, and this also gets to the second half of the question. Then there's no question about what you're getting the stock for. Yeah, look, yep. I was there in the room, I helped form the company, I did the hard work to get the idea going, and I'm gonna get that over four years and that's my bucket of stock, but you know what, there's this other thing I gotta do called the job, CEO, and this is what I gotta do for that, and I find that framework to work well. And what, what a, would you say the same thing in a case where um, kind of equal experience, like uh, I think back to, um, you know, when, when I'm working with a CTO, maybe, maybe not just a lead engineer, but somebody who's right. really going to grow. So maybe in that case, it's it's a little bit closer to 50-50, sure. right? Yeah. Whereas if it's, um, uh, you know, lead engineer um, who's your iOS developer or something like that, maybe yeah. it's a little bit different. Yeah, and it's easier with two than it is with seven. And, you know, yeah. and some, some teams yeah. get formed with large groups like that. I don't, have you been watching the HBO uh, Silicon Valley show at all? I've, I've got it all queued up. I have every episode sitting there. I just haven't found the block of time to so, go do it. So one of the, it, it's actually it's actually quite funny um, in, a, in an over-the-top way in some oh, cases. But um, uh, one, of the, one of the conversations is around this exact topic. Like, mm -hmm. you know, does that guy, should he really have any stock? And, and, and so... Uh, and one of the running jokes is the guy whose house they're living in, by virtue of him being the incubator, gets 10% of the company. And that's kind of the running gag throughout. And he's, he's kind of a larger-than-life character. So uh, you, you should definitely check it out. It's not... I can't wait. Li like, some of it, I, I, I think, um, you know, we, we geeks out here have a certain culture. And I think, uh, I think they're doing a pretty good job of, of getting the big pieces right. And then, and then you know they're injecting just ridiculousness into other areas, which makes it entertaining for a broader audience, right? So uh, there is some ridiculousness that happens out here. Yeah. So maybe it's accurate. No, no, never. There's <laughs> never any ridiculousness out here. Um, all right. Well, let's um, let's move on to the next question. And um, oh, here's a, here's a here's a question. Um, and, and actually, I, I, have a, I have an opinion about this. It's about business plans. So okay. Jeff, Jeff in San Jose wants to know, what should be included in a great business plan so investors will take you seriously? Okay, so 
in my opinion, you should never write a business plan if you're trying to start a Silicon Valley style startup company. Exactly. Period. I totally agree. Um, it does not mean that you should not think through and actually have a solid plan. But the format of the old, what was that piece of shrink wrap software, the biz plan writer thing? Yeah, biz plan something. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. Gion, Gion or was the yeah, name yeah, of the company. Yeah. Uh, that format is a format that, in my opinion, is essentially completely deprecated for this style of business. You know, a 10 to 12 slide deck that really outlines the key concepts, uh, what the prototype looks like, what the revenue projections look like, what the market's about. Um, you know, PowerPoint is the thing to do it in. I mean, uh, other people use Keynote too. Uh, either way, but y you want to have it well thought out. So some people misinterpret this advice as, oh, no, no, you don't need a business plan. I think that's completely wrong. It's just the format of the business plan should be slides, and they should be thoughtful slides. Absolutely. I, I, I just had this question come up on Tuesday w with an um, uh, entrepreneur friend of mine who's, who's young, and, uh, and he said, you know, should, should I do a business plan? And I'm like, you know, that, it's a strike against you. Like if you, <laughs> if you tell an investor you have a business plan, they're going to, they're going to think you're crazy. And I know, I know that used to be the case. Um, right. but, uh, you know, I said, do 12 slides, make them really short, not a lot of text, you know, right. on them, like right. mostly images or screenshots mm -hmm. or demo or whatever else. And, uh, uh, and that to me, that's how you convince an investor that, um, that there's something worth doing. So, um, uh, so, all right, let's, let's keep going here. Um, this is an anonymous uh, email that came in. What is the determining factor in you making a decision to invest in a company? Okay, our fund is very unusual in that regard, and we actually have it right on our website. If you go to bullpencap.com, there's a f landing page. It says, there are three things you need for us to invest. That's literally the landing really? page. Because we got asked the question so many times, we're like, why don't we make that the landing page? That's perfect. Our business model is very specific, unlike a lot of venture firms. A lot of venture firms are like, wow, is it a big enough market? Do we like the founder, et cetera? Don't get me wrong, I care about all of that. But our model is very specific. We need your existing investors to support the deal, which means you have existing investors. That's number one. Number two, um, we, we, we need to make sure uh, that the company is post-product market fit, as we say. And what does that mean? It means somebody already cares. Either consumers are downloading and using the app, or enterprises are buying the software, or whatever the service is. And then finally, there's got to be a near-term milestone over the next 9 to 12 months to be able to bring the closer in, hence the bullpen analogy. Got it. So three things. Insiders support the deal, meaning you got one, and they're going to help out the next round. Uh, number two, it's working. It's early, but it's working. And then, and then finally, if we, if we put gas on the fire over the next 9 to 12 months, you're going to triple your revenues. You're going to quadruple the number of users. And therefore, the next investor is going to be excited about coming in. Perfect. All right. Um, so we have, we have a call, and uh, oh, wow. this is from, uh, from Jeff in San Francisco. It's about preferences. Okay. So um, Jeff, uh, Jeff can, you, can you hear us? Are you there? Yeah. Hi, Joe and Paul. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, right. I have a question about uh, seed stage preferences. So um, I have a friend whose company has a investor, um, an angel investor, who has more than a 1x preference. Um, so when this uh, company goes to raise a Series A, how does that implication uh, affect their raise? Okay, Th this is an interesting question, and uh, in, in some ways it's one that I see more than most guys. I, I split my time between uh, Philadelphia and Silicon Valley. I, I have a house in both spots, and it's very interesting to see the difference in East Coast and West Coast venture terms, hmm. in particular with East and West Coast angel syndicates, even if it's friends and family money. It is very, very common for the first friends and family or angel round on the East Coast to have a preference associated, and it is very uncommon on the West Coast. And uh, kind of the long and short of what I think happens next is the next guy gets to set what the rules are. <laughs> if you're, exactly. I, I give you an example, if you're an East Coast angel syndicate and you come out and you've got a West Coast fund come in, they're going to tell you what they want to do. Uh, and I, I would say that the next guy has a lot to say about what's going to happen. If it's friends and family and single angels, I'm not so worried about precedent getting set. Some guys worry that, oh, the precedent has been set that everybody gets liquidation preference. Well, you know, you had one angel write you a $50,000 check. I, I don't think you're stuck in a real precedent problem at that yeah, point in time. Yeah, yeah. 
What are, are there other differences that you see with the East Coast versus West Coast? You know, since you're kind of living in both yeah. worlds right now, other things that you see that that founders run into in, in different geographies? Well, sure. Um, pricing sensitivity is different on the East and West Coast. How, how so? Like, what's uh, uh, you know uh, a deal that you might expect to be at a six uh, six million dollar pre money on the West Coast is going to be four million dollars in the East Coast. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So you'll you'll see because the the mindset is different. Uh, so I would say that the valuations, six versus four is very common, say for a seed stage deal difference. Um, uh, preference versus non-preference, uh, liquidation preference on the, on the stock. What, what are some other things that are different? Um, those are definitely two of the most common ones. What about family money? You see more like family money going into like friends and family rounds on the East Coast versus the West Coast, or is it pretty pretty evenly distributed? It, it is so common. I mean, in many ways, Joe, what we're seeing now is that there's three seed rounds. There's the friends and family round, there's the institutional round, and then there's the top-up round. And Bullpen does the last of the three stages of seed. And I don't care if you're in Nebraska or if you're in Philadelphia or you're out here, there tends to be this first founder slash friends and family round, and we're seeing more and more of that. No, oh, by the way, some of those are on Kickstarter too. So we're now seeing nomenclature that kind of goes pre-seed, seed, and post-seed. Exactly. And, and it, that really does seem to actually be happening, uh, and now we're starting to have words to describe the, the, that now somewhat continuous process of raising money as opposed to my seed round is done, now I go get my A. Well, and it reminds me of when they were trying to name the, um, you know, the super angels, right, or the micro VCs right. or whatever. And, and so... And, and I, I think it was Manu Kumar who recently had a really nice blog post about how yep. that, that three-phase process is starting to happen. And, and I think, what would you say, like maybe the friends and family is like the 50 to 100K sort of range and well, a little bit more the next time? I actually, I followed up Manu's post and it's right, so I followed up Manu's article with an article on TechCrunch about two weeks later oh, called right. Seed is a that's Process. Right. And the diagram I have in there basically says that the cumulative raise of the seed is up to five million. And if you start at the beginning, the first money is 250 and less. And so pre-seed is zero to 250. And then uh, the, the seed is between 250 and two million. And then the post seed is between two and five. And that's by no means hard and fast, but that's what the anecdotal data looks like that yeah. we've got at our fund and as well as other funds that we talk to to get some access to data. And there's a nice little diagram that they posted in that article on TechCrunch. So take a look at it. Uh, seed is a process. It was about two weeks ago. Um, and I, I think we're going to see more and more about that theme emerge because it's to some extent important because if the founder understands that game, it's a game to be won, right? Yep. There's yep. gamesmanship to be done at each stage and you want to you, you wanna be smart about it. How, how do you, you, you don't do the early stage seed stuff, uh, like the first money in necessarily, but how, how do you answer, I, I had someone this week um, where uh, they hadn't actually built any product yet. It was just, you know, a couple of people who were getting together, and they they had left their jobs, but they hadn't actually built anything left. Um, you know, the, the advice I gave to them was, until you get something working and can demonstrate it to people, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to raise money from any of the typical uh, seed funds or early stage VCs. Are, are you still uh, seeing that I've, to be the case these days? I've got a stump speech on that that goes just like this. You have a stump speech on everything. I tell you what, I should go into politics, right? <laughs> It, it, well, it, I, I, the Philadelphia <laughs> mayorship, I, you know, it's oh, yeah. got to be coming yeah. up any time now. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm, you got I'm the looking, Italian vote, so yeah, okay. you're you're good. I can say that, you know. Yeah, thanks. thanks. I, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I think I think I actually I think I'm going to leave the show now and go do that. <laughs> uh, no. So the stump speech goes like this: There are two things that institutional seed investors invest in: star founders and product with traction. And, I, and when you say that to a first-time CEO, it explains this kind of bifurcated world. I don't understand. This guy did this thing, and it was just a PowerPoint. I was like, yeah, well, he sold his last company for $100 million. Right. And then, right. then you go, but look, don't be upset about this. There's good news in this. There's another path for you called product attraction. So if you aren't star founder, hopefully next time around you are. And then you can do it maybe on the PowerPoint. But if you look at the really good institutional seed funds, it is very rare that they invest on a PowerPoint alone for a first-time entrepreneur. Yep. They do occasionally, the idea is so big, or the, the, the fit of the entrepreneur is so good, or the passion of the investor is so there. But in general, I tell people they want to go see the institutional seed funds, I say, I, I, not useful for me to make an introduction until you've got some level of traction. Yeah, makes sense. 
All right, great. Um, well, let's. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a moment here and um, remind you again. Uh, call us toll free at one eight four 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 founder. Uh, you can email at help at founderline.com or you can tweet to at founderline. Uh, get in touch with us. We, we'd love to get your feedback. We've got a few people standing by and we'll, uh, we'll get to you as soon as we can. Um, but first, I want, to, uh, I want to take a moment to thank some of our sponsors. Mm -hmm. we, we couldn't do this show without the help of uh, our, our great sponsors. And uh, the two sponsors um, I'd like to talk about are Auric and Ustream. So let, let's start with Ustream. Um, you know, we, when we decided to do this show, we had a decision to make about what technology we we're going to use. And um, I was lucky enough to be able to get in touch with Brad Hunstable, who's the CEO of Ustream. And they, they've just been so supportive throughout. They said, hey, we, we'd love to... Uh, to figure this out with you. And throughout that process, we've worked with uh, two guys, Alden and Warren, who have just been great, very responsive to our questions. I literally, uh, when we first uh, got the, the feed up and running, it literally took 10 minutes. It was, it was that easy. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. So um, uh, if, you, if you're thinking about doing some streaming, whether it's for uh, a show or an event or whatever it might be, um, definitely go talk to the folks over at Ustream. Uh, they'll be as good to you as, as they've been to us. Um, for more information, you can go to their website. It's ustream.tv. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Auric. So um, Mitch Zookley and the team over there uh, have been fantastic as well. Uh, you know, when, when you're building a startup, uh, a lot of times people think, well, I need a lawyer just so they can do all that legal paperwork. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, they have to do that legal paperwork, but you also want to get somebody who can be one of your closest and most trusted advisors. J just think about the number of transactions that lawyers do and, uh, and what happens in those cases. They, they, they've seen everything. They've seen every trick you know, under the sun, and and you haven't most likely as a as a first or even a second time, or you know, even I've I've been in a, seven startups. I still haven't seen every trick because Paul keeps inventing new ones. <laughs> so so uh, so when you're when you're getting that company going, make sure you get a great legal partner. Um, I, I've known Mitch and his team over there for over twelve years now, and uh, they are the best, uh, and they're they're just great to work with. So. Um, you can find out more if you, uh, if you go to auric.com, and I'm sure, uh, sure they'll be able to help you out. So um, now we're going to switch over to our weekly segment. It's called Ask the Lawyer. And uh, we, um, we're very fortunate to have Mitch Zookley with us. Uh, Mitch is the chairman and CEO of Auric, who I was just talking about. So... Um, Mitch, uh, welcome to Founderline. How are you? Doing great, Joe. Great to speak with you and Paul. How are you guys doing? All right. We're doing great. We're, uh, we're having fun. So um, just to, to give everyone, th the idea of this segment is to um, cover a legal topic that's relevant to startups. And uh, we've got both Mitch uh, on the legal side as well as Paul on the, on the entrepreneur and VC side to, to offer some perspectives. And, you know, I think um, the topic for today is around uh, convertible debt versus equity, and it's it's one of the big decisions when you're doing your your first money in is, you know, should I do it via a convertible note, uh, or should I try and do it with equity? And there there are pros and, and cons um, to both approaches. Um, you know, the speed of the transaction, the complexity, the cost of the legal fees. Uh, in some cases, you know, there are some seed investors who say, I won't invest in anything unless it's an equity deal. I don't want to do convertible notes. Um, so, so, Mitch, maybe you can start us off. Um, just if you could walk us through some of the pros and cons around uh, this decision regarding convertible debt versus equity, that would be great. You bet, Joe. I think the most important thing to start with uh, is to kind of come up with perspective on what you want to achieve. And I think the founders who are raising money really have four objectives when they're doing a seed round. The first is they want to do something quickly. The second, they want it done cheaply. Nothing worse than spending a lot of money on lawyers, especially early in the process. Third, you want documents that are clean. Zero chance of, of some sort of strange 
uh, precedent, uh, which Paul spoke to a little while ago, but also you just don't want to have a situation where you give up meaningful rights. And fourth, you want to have a situation which is frictionless. You don't want to spend a lot of time eroding goodwill with your potential investors, fighting over the substance of these documents or the form of the documents. You just want to have something which is done easily. So clean, quick, cheap, and frictionless. And I'll provide a little bit of historical perspective. For the, you know, for the period from the 1990s through about 2012, the overwhelming majority of seed deals were done with convertible debt. Why was that? It's because it was the cheapest and cleanest and quickest way to do the documents. The legal documents are about three pages long. They're just not very, very, very complicated. They're very cheap to do, and they're, they're, they're pretty routine. And um, so it met the objectives of, of clean, quick, cheap, and frictionless very well. There was some debate about whether you would do a discount or have warrants, but that's a really small debate, and it was really just about, uh, you know, uh, what kind of benefit would the, would the founders get, uh, would, would, the, would the investors get for coming in early? But it was a pretty well-worn path, and, and there wasn't a lot of risk to it. Historically, that was the way to do it. And then around 2012, 2011, you started to see as C, as C deals became much more institutionalized, some pushback from the most sophisticated investors push back on the thought that, hey, I'm putting money in, I'm putting money in at, at substantial risk, and this 20% warrant coverage concept or discount concept doesn't really reward me fully for all the risk I'm taking for coming in early, especially if the company is very successful. And as a result of that, we saw uh, an important variation, which is quite common now, which was convertible debt with a cap. In other right, words, right. you would convert at a discount into the next round provided that in no event would you convert at a price higher than, say, four or five million bucks. Um, and from there, there was another development, which was a number of, uh, of important investors who were saying, we really would rather have, a, have, have something very simple uh, called a series seed set of documents. And Ted Wang, lawyer at Fenwick, was probably the first guy, I think, to coin that term where we found that, that, that there was a preference among many investors to actually put together very light financing documents, which would spell out a bunch of rights uh, and, and, and not have any question about what happened in a change of control and, and, any, of that, and any of that stuff. It would, it would address a couple of rights, and it was really driven more by the, the investment community than it was driven by the, the needs of founders, in my mind. And since then, we've seen a further development, which I think is, is one that probably will be somewhat lasting, Y Combinator uh, re produced some documents called SAFE, which stands for Simple Agreement on Future Equity Documents, back in December of 2013. Those docs are available on Y Combinator's website, along with a primer about them. There's four different versions of them available, and, and YC announced that they expected most of their future YC startups to use that form when, re uh, when, use when raising money, beginning uh, with their winter 2014 class, which just did their demo day back in March. And other, other seed investors like uh, Start Engine, which is an LA Accelerator, or 500 startups, I think have stated that they're, they plan to use SAFE. Uh, so we're seeing an awful lot of versions of simplified documents coming online, which, uh, which will become the trend. I think that the, to, to sort of go through the pros and cons, at the end of the day, the most important thing is to get money in a way that's clean, quick, cheap, and frictionless. And I think whether you do it through convertible debt with a cap, which I think is, is still probably something you see at least half the time, or some sort of an equity uh, feature or using the Y Combinator safe docs, it doesn't much matter. Anyone, if, uh, any, any competent lawyer will be able to work with those documents uh, you know, f with you quickly. I don't think that, I don't have a strong preference uh, for one form versus the other for our founders. On, uh, on the margins, I actually prefer to do a seed round and do a little equity if you can, but it's, it's, really, um, it's really about making sure that you, you um, just have either one of those those documents in a form that's normal and don't waste a lot of time energy uh, and certainly not money fighting over it uh, if you have someone who's competent they'll know what they're doing they'll be familiar with those docs and i think that uh, uh the, you'll find that they're clean and don't have a lot of surprises for for the founders yeah i, I, I love the the history there mitch because uh you, you know this this stuff just keeps evolving and you know, Paul, in your case, you you are usually at the tail end, as we discussed earlier, about of that seed process, and you you probably you inherit lots of interesting oh. uh, structures. I bet. So uh, I can't tell you the errors we've inherited <laughs> too. I, I mean, we had a deal where a major Sandhill fund 
basically ended up computing the pre-money valuation wrong by $12 million because they misunderstood the way that the conversion caps yeah, worked. Yeah. And we had a partner call us up and go, oh my God, how am I gonna tell my partners that I'm off by 12, I've signed this sheet, I'm off by $12 million. High or low? Oh, oh it was in the, in the, in the company's favor. Oh, the, really? The post money on the deal was $12 million higher than he thought because he got the mechanics of the conversions wrong. Wow, wow. And boy, I mean, I'm sure he's never gonna make that mistake again too, but when you sit at the end of a set of notes at different prices at different caps, the conversion mechanics can be actually quite complicated by the time you actually price and do the round. Yeah, no, I, 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 Mitch, I remember uh, in, in one of one of my experiences uh, that math like was just like voodoo, and and I had to have some somebody explain it to me like multiple times because there there were people who had come in at different prices. That's and right. It, you can't look at it and intuitively go, oh well, that guy should have six percent. That's like, right. It might might actually be eight point three percent, right? And. Uh, uh, so, so Mitch, any any that's advice? Exactly right. Any advice to a uh, a founder who's who's going through that process? Um, uh, you know, I, I recall a situation where I had a number of um, uh, people who had already agreed to come in on a convertible note, and then I, I got to an investor toward the end who said, "Well, we'd love to come in, but uh, we'll only do it if it's an equity deal." and uh, and that puts a lot of pressure on the on the founder or CEO because you've already sort of agreed to one thing with this set of five or six people over here, uh, and then this this other person comes along who wants to kind of change the game a little bit. Any any thoughts about a situation like that? Yeah, as painful as it is, Joe, to try to get everybody in on the same terms, I really encourage people to try to do that. Uh, because if, if you've got a, uh, a challenging thing that's kind of knit together with some convertible debt here and some equity there or a whole variety of different prices at which people are converting, you know, mistakes get made. It's complicated. People yeah. uh, can find that they invested at a valuation which is higher or lower than they anticipated. Uh, and obviously, obviously that, that can lead to lots of friction uh, and it can lead to friction very early in the life cycle of a company. So um, I, I think it's really best uh, to, to do whatever you can to, to, to uh, reconcile everybody and bring them all into the same tent on the same form uh, if you possibly can. And on balance, I prefer equity if you can do it because you don't have all the complicated conversion and cap issues. You just set a price and you've done it. Um, so I, I think it, that uh, it is the simplest way to do it if you can. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, uh, the most important thing is to get that money in and to make sure you do it in a clean way without giving up lots of rights. I, I would emphasize, and while this, none of this is intended to constitute legal advice, I do see people screw up all the time when they do this stuff on their own. And um, that's a challenging issue. It's a little bit like buttoning your shirt. If you get it right out of the outset, it's okay. But if you've got a couple buttons down and you got to unbutton it, it's kind of a mess. So <laughs> it's one of the times that it really makes sense to, uh, to get it right. By, by the way, that's one of the reasons I love Mitch and Paul is because they come up with these analogies like the, the shirt buttoning or whatever it might be that are just, just fantastic. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure to remember that one, Mitch. Uh, so, uh, well, listen, I, I, think we're, uh, I think we're good. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us again, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again next week. All right, Joe, total pleasure. Nice talking with you, Paul. Have a good rest of the show. Thank you, Mitch. You got you got to love that the uh, the old uh, button the shirt uh, oh, yeah. analogy. So um, so once again we're um, we're here to take your calls and answer your emails. Um, uh, toll free one eight four 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 founder. Email is help at founderline com and tweet to at founderline and we'll uh, we'll try and help you out. So. Um, We've got uh, a couple callers on hold, and uh, we, we had an email that came in before the break, so why don't we, why don't we address that first? Um, the email is from Larry in Yuba City. Larry's a, our first repeat emailer slash caller. Wow. So Larry, Larry uh, was, we got a regular. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I'm gonna have to go go uh, visit Yuba City sometime. So. Um, the question is, uh, it's, it's probably my mom masquerading as, uh, as Larry from Yuba City, but uh, is there a resource or a rule of thumb for determining how much equity an early executive who is not a founder should be offered? Uh, and then how does the market compensation for comparable positions like CFO, COO, et cetera, uh, adjust based on the level of equity offered? 
So startup compensation is the general topic. Yeah. Uh, there are definite guidelines, and I just I don't think this is the right form to actually go into them. I mean, wh what I mean is th they're actually quite complicated, and lots of people have different philosophies about it. But I'll give you one or two of the nuggets out of it. Uh, series A company, you're going to get twice as much stock as a Series B company. An SVP is going to get twice as much stock as a VP. A VP is going to get twice as much stock as a director. There's a lot of powers of... T a lot of the tables you see, there's a lot of powers of two. So if you're the SVP of a B company, well, slide it up to and down to <laughs> at, at high level. Yep. And, and there's more truth to that than there isn't, but you really need to get into the nitty gritty of it. What kind of company is it? How is it capitalized? And that's why I, I, I hesitate to give the more specific feedback, other than that there are conversions between jobs and rounds that make a lot of sense, yeah. and they're, they're based in some actual fact as opposed to just finger in the wind. Well, and I, in, in my experience, um, there's so many variables in that equation, like the stage of the company, uh, you, you know, how much money have they raised, what's the experience level of this person, et cetera. Um, th there's, no, there's no general rule of thumb. I know there used to be like these salary surveys that came yeah. out from, mm -hmm. you know, AEA credit union and then others over time and um, I think I think those are more accurate for the later stage companies like sure. if you're joining as an engineer at Cisco here, here's what you might expect for a, a comp package or something right. like that but for for early stage startups um, I mean a lot of it comes down to uh, you know you're worth what someone decides they think you're worth right or what, whatever that phrase is and uh, and I and I I've seen you know an early stage engineer be offered as much as five to ten percent of the company because sure. they have a very specific skill set. Yeah. Um, at at one stage, and that same person a year later might be 0.5 to you know three quarters of a percent. Well, you know, one of the things I learned as at, when, when I was CEO a couple times was every time I made a job offer, I basically made three offers. You want the high stock and, and low salary? You want the middle of the road offer? Or do you want the opposite offer? And I found that by having basically three offers, it did a lot. It told you who, it told you who was coming into the company, which mm -hmm. was an important signal. Yep. You couldn't have all high stock people. You couldn't have all high salary people. You kind of needed a little bit of a mix once you got there. Well, and I, and I love the, the person who says, oh, yeah, I, I want the high salary and the high yeah, stock. Yeah, I, I, love, I love that. You yes, that's, that, yes you, you get that response. There's no doubt about that. Um, and obviously, there's negotiation to be done. But your point about you're worth what you get paid is great. But that doesn't mean there can't be different kinds of compensation that incent you in the right way. And I would say that that's something that I see a lot of CEOs make the mistake of not investing enough in. Yeah. You know, they just kind of go, okay, here's the offer. Let's get this guy in here and, you know, spend a little time to figure out what, what's that guy or guy want. Absolutely. You know? And especially in this hiring market, um, you know, I, I have a friend who was just telling me the other day that uh, they had hired a designer and, uh, the day came and she didn't show up, mm. and t took another offer. Didn't even let him know, which wow. is which is pretty pretty slimy. Um, yeah. uh, you know, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna do something like that, let somebody know. But in, in those in those sorts of situations, I always say, you know, even once the compensation is decided, like that person's not really there until you you get them in the door, and even then they're right. not really there, right? Um, <laughs> so so you just gotta have someone stay on them, take them out for coffee, you know. Uh, meet their their spouse or significant other. You know, just just keep keep working them until they show up. You know, three weeks later or whatever whatever it might be. Okay. All right. So uh, next we're going to turn to a call. We have uh, Paul on the line, and Paul has a question about product strategy. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, great. Thanks, guys. Uh, hey, Paul and Joe. This is. Paul from Portland, Oregon. Thanks for sharing your insights today. I got a question for you. Uh, can you hear me all right? Just making sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go for it, Paul. Awesome, great. So I'm here at a mid-stage uh, mid startup. We've got a few rounds of financing under our belt. And I want to hear some of your thoughts on product strategy. In particular, uh, I want to hear your advice on planning when to do a quick release cycle for a new product, you know, ship a bare bones MVP, minimum vial product, and then iterate on that, versus when you, you know, save up some of your kindling for a bigger release with more, more market impact for driving awareness, 
generating leads and generating interest from, from press and analysts. And it's kind of the, the pros and cons of those decisions. Is this, a, is this an enterprise or consumer company? Yeah, enterprise SaaS. Yeah, I think that I asked that question immediately because I think the rules are very different on those two sides of the fence. Exactly. Consumer, you're going to play the game very different on the consumer side than on the enterprise SaaS. Enterprise SaaS, I, I like the description. You're, you're implicitly tipping kind of where I think you're going to expect the answer to go. Having releases that are thoughtful and high impact that essentially you can make news as opposed to your continuous build process is important. You need a, a, a queued up release every once in a while to be able to get the analyst to re-engage with the company, to get the press to recover, et cetera. And if all it was was uh, we did 18 point releases over the last nine months every two weeks, you know, th that's not going to be near as newsworthy as there's a major new milestone and set of features that are available in this product and that's going to change the game. Yep. Uh, and I think that having whatever your development cycle have the capability of doing both major and minor releases at the same time, um, that's where your VP of engineering earns his paycheck. Being able to have the major releases get done at an appropriate pace while never falling behind on all the point stuff that's got to happen. Um, and that, that's a real art for him, and a VP of engineering when do that is, is, is worth gold. Well, and, and it's, it's a real challenge, right? Because uh, frequently there are demands coming from the sales team or right. someone else. And I, in those cases, I actually think you know, it's the fit between the, if there is a VP of product and, and the VP of engineering sort of, okay, we've got these basic point releases we got to get out, but we got to hit the, you know, we got to march, uh, we're going to do an event in March that's, that's right. going to be around, you know, product X. And I, I totally agree about the enterprise versus consumer. Consumer, you, it's much easier to kind of keep streaming stuff out and right. do it in blog posts and, and or, you know, add um, kind of a 1% a, a feature as opposed to a, all right, this is 25% different than the thing we were doing right. before. Right. Um, I, I also think in some cases there's... Um, there's a challenge around the customer that you're working with, right? Because if you're an enterprise customer, they, they don't want to be changing their stuff like every three That's weeks, correct. right? They, they might be able to do it once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I, I would say in those cases, uh, you, you, know, you need to take into account the, the release cycle and or the, the impact on the customer base as well. But uh, it's, a, it's a great, uh, great question. So, um, so thanks, for, uh, thanks for sending that. Um, we, uh, we've got another one here. Uh, this is an anonymous email. Um, and, and how appropriate, because it's about uh, Secret. Ooh. So, uh, are apps like Secret, with their absurd valuations, a sure sign that there's a bubble in consumer mobile? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt at this point that we're the inflationary part of a bubble. I, 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 just, I say it that simply, and some of my venture brethren- You're calling it, huh? You're calling it. I'm not saying where we are in it. We're in the inflation stage. And this is the problem with bubbles. It could go on a lot longer than you think is the dilemma. But the idea that we are in a normalized stasis kind of situation, absolutely not. We are in a bubble inflating situation. But that doesn't mean it might not be five years until it pops. It might also be five months. Um, so I don't think there's any question. I, picking on secret more so than anyone else's Yes, that's the example used in the mail, but I, I, I think there's any number of companies you can take a look at on the, on the consumer side. And take a look at what happened to the public markets in terms of enterprise SaaS valuations. Yeah. Almost every one of those high flyers had their valuation chopped in half over the last 90 days. That's a pretty steep correction pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. It had nothing to do with consumer, right? Um, yeah, those, those are... Um, I, it, was it Josh Koppelman, one of your Philly brethren? Right. Uh, didn't, didn't he have a post that said... If I just keep uh, calling the bubble every year, you know, it's it's like a, a broken clock is right twice a day, right? That, that's so, ex that's exactly right. So so, uh, so I, you know, I look these things come and go. Uh, sometimes there's more power uh, in the entrepreneur's hands. Sometimes it's more on the investor's side. And um, you know, I, I think you you kind of have to put blinders on and ignore that stuff and just just keep marching ahead and and doing what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. All right, so we've got a. Uh, Another email here from Ben, and uh, the question is for Paul. Paul, how would you recommend some position their market opportunity for companies at the post-seed stage Bullpen is focusing on? Uh, we're, we're a friends and family round seed stage company. 
and are trying to tightly focus on our market opportunity. Some investors say that we should position as uh, you know, being massive. Do you have any general recommendations on how to position the market opportunity for bullpen? Well, so um, I'm not quite sure I follow the question completely, yeah. but if it's friends and family only and the institutional seed guys aren't in there, you're not ready for me yet. Exactly, yeah. That said, I, I can speak for the people who were in front of me, the floodgates, the trues, the first rounds, felices. Um, yeah, you, you need to demonstrate not only that you're executing, you have a product with some traction, but that, the, that winning the game has a prize big enough to be worth the time. I mean, very important. And by the way, that's one of the reasons that our post-seed model is different. I don't need to spend a ton of time in the post-seed part looking at market size anymore. If you got Josh Koppelman at first round in nine months ago, Yes, I'm going to check the work, but I don't need to spend a ton of time on market size. I need to spend a ton of time on next three quarters of sales growth. Uh, that, that, to me, is yeah. kind of what the difference between the institutional seed and post-seed is about, really around where the, the product market fit has happened. I'm not sure if that, that was what you're getting at, but that's my best shot at it. I, I, th I think so. I, th I, think, uh, I, I think it was around, you know, if, if, if you've done friends and family, and as you said earlier, you're, you're, they're kind of like the three phases. They're not quite ready. They're more in phase one and moving into phase two. And, yeah. and some of it depends on where the, the product is as well. So uh, I, th I think you have to take all of that into account. Mm -hmm. All right, another uh, anonymous question. Um, how do you maintain work-life balance while working at a startup or working as a VC who lives in Philadelphia and flies out to Silicon Valley all the time? Either way, whatever, whatever you want to handle. Well, I'm going to give you the politically correct answer, incorrect answer. Uh, having work-life balance at the early stage of a startup almost is, is the wrong question to even be asking. I mean, you, you are going to go endeavor to do something crazy, world-changing, et cetera, and it's going to be your baby for a while. And at that earliest stage, the idea that there can be work-life balance it's, I think it's almost impossible to do. There are later stages in the company, and there are certain positions in early stage startups where you can have it. But you know, we're kind of focused on the CEO side of this with a lot of these questions. Yeah. You're going to be the CEO of a startup company. You're going to have to make sacrifices that are, that are really significant. And uh, I, I won't kid you about that. I had to do it too. I did four companies uh, over 15 years. And uh, you know the decisions you make about when to have your family or when not to have your family are important. And I I'd highly encourage you to speak to other CEOs and or other founders as well as some of the people you're looking at to have as investors. Um, because I just, I just don't think you can have those two things at the early stage. Yeah, what, what about, and I, by the way, I totally agree with that. Um, I know like in between the startups I've done, I tend to focus on getting healthy, spending right. more time with my family, doing a little traveling, um, because I know once I'm back in it again, you're, yeah. you're just all in and it's 24-7. But what, what do you do in a case where you, where you have employees and uh, the, you know, they're, they're not quite buying into the, and, and by the way, I'm not saying you need to like sleep under your desk every night right. and you need to be working 18 hours a day. There, there's work-life balance and then there's startup hours versus, you know, nine to five right. sort of things. And, right. and there's, there's a, a group of people who say, well, there are people who are very efficient and can get a lot done in nine to five. But the reality is, like, you're thinking about a startup 24-7. It's right. always on your mind. So how, how do you, what advice would you have for somebody, say, a CEO who's managing a small team and they have employees who aren't quite buying into the, uh, the startup pace of life. So let me answer this kind of obliquely. It's <laughs> one of my, it was one of my favorite quotes having worked with Pincus. I remember, I remember one day at Tribe, Mark comes into the office and he says, you know, being a startup CEO is like waking up from a nightmare every day and sleeping one minute more the next night. And I, I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, that's kind of a profound thing to say at yeah. like eight in the morning yeah, or whatever. Yeah. But he's kind of right. And, and so... You are going to do something that the chances are so slim of working that if you aren't having a nightmare every night about it, you probably aren't thinking about the problem the right way. And then as things start to work, you get to sleep just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And that story and picture is the one that I think is the one to keep in mind when, when you then have a team. Because you have to now have shielding of some of that 
right. so that the team can actually focus because they can't, the team can't be in the nightmare with you every night. Yes. Team's got to be focused. And so you having the intestinal fortitude to shield your team from some of the nightmare that you have to prevent is, is one of the most important things a startup CEO has to have, that ability to shield them from that. Yep. Well, and, that, and that's, uh, you know, I remember being in, in that chair, and one of the key things is to have a, an investor or an advisor, somebody who you can go to to talk about those nightmare sorts of situations, because you don't want to scare the crap out of the team. You, <laughs> right. you, but, but you need to... You need to talk to somebody because, I mean, there, there are some lonely days, as you know, That's right. where you're sitting there going, why am I beating my head against the wall and what am I doing, you know, doing this right now? Right. Like, this is, this is never going to work. And you've got, you know, you've taken money from all these great investors, right. you know, maybe your, your parents or your That's friends right. and family. Um, you've got all these uh, employees who are counting on paychecks and they, right. they might have kids and sure. and mortgages and everything else. Right. So um, I, I just think that's one of the most critical things. And it, and it, it kind of goes back to the lawyer point earlier, like having somebody you can call up and just sort of vent to and know that there are no, um, you know, no holds barred. Like you, you can talk about anything, right. you can be vulnerable. Uh, you, you can't always be that way with say, you know, your lead investor. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, I have to say when we were working together, I, I think we, uh, we had a pretty candid uh, yeah. conversation going. And, that, and that's, that's one of the marks of um, figuring out that you're working with someone uh, is that you, you feel like you can be vulnerable and not be judged. And, sure. and I, I remember, you know, there are a number of situations where, uh, where I was like, oh, I wonder how Paul's going to react to this, and uh, and you know, it was, it was it was great. It was it was like having someone on your management team. So um, that's what happens when you get investors from Philly. They tell you how it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and I, and I think it, it also um, I found, and th this is not universal, but I found the best investors are the ones who have been founders and CEOs before because they know what you're going through. They know the nightmare you're living. But that's what that's look. That's what's so cool about the modern venture capital world. You know, when we were doing our first startup, so I did, I did four before this, you've done seven. We're doing our first startups. The, the person giving you the check is a finance person when we did our first company. Yep, yep. And now, 20 years later, it's super cool because the person giving you the check is someone who's been there. Yes. And that is really, that's why I think this is a real golden age for entrepreneurship because you can have that person on your board who's actually had the problem you have. Yeah, no, it's uh, like I, I just think that's an invaluable thing is to have somebody who you can you can really relate to. The other, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do another Paul Martino suck up here, which is um, I remember we were talking about something and it was marketing related, and uh, and I said, hey Paul, what do you think about that? And it was the first time a VC had ever said to me, you know, Joe. I don't know a thing about marketing, or it wasn't quite exactly that, but it, but it was like you know I can have you talk to X or Y or Z, but um, you know a lot of times VCs are experts about every topic under and the sun. And that is, I'll tell you, Joe, that is one of the most dangerous things. I think any good investor or advisor knows what they're good at, and when they don't know the answer, they tell you. It's very rare. So that is, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, is a I appreciate the compliment, and uh, you should, if you're the CEO, insist on that kind of feedback. Absolutely. Well, uh, as, as fun, uh, as much fun as we're having, unfortunately, we are out of time. We're going to have to do this again sometime. But great. Uh, thank you for being such a great guest. Uh, and uh, if you want to follow, pa follow Paul, um, uh, you, you can go to Bullpen Capital, check out the site, or uh, you can reach him on Twitter at APA. Is that how you Actually, at Bullpen Cap is easier. Uh, okay, at That's Bullpen more my Cap. Personal okay, one. perfect, perfect. Um, uh, next week, tune in for another episode of Founderline. We'll have uh, Greg Sands will be our guest from Costanoa Venture Capital. Uh, Greg's been involved in a bunch of great businesses, including Cisco and Netscape back in his startup days, and then um, as an investor at Sutter Hill, and now uh, Costanoa, which is a firm that he started. And um, uh, we'll uh, have Greg next week, um, next Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks once again to our amazing sponsors, Oric and Ustream. Uh, send us your questions. We'll be uh, looking for them throughout the week. So uh, email us at help at founderline.com or tweet at us at founderline. And uh, you can go to the website. You can subscribe. We'll let you know about uh, upcoming guests, uh, when the videos get posted up to the site. And um, 
uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to, to keep you in the loop. Thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you next week.